This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with under-12s coach at Slavia Prague, Jonathan Davis. He discusses the challenges faced when coaching players from different cultural backgrounds, the effects a country's history and political standing can have on a game's culture within a country, as well as the strategies he used in order to get coach buy-in when trying to alter the Slavia Prague methodology. We would absolutely love it if you'd be part of the growth of this podcast by sharing it with friends and family and obviously subscribing. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So Jonathan, really appreciate you jumping on. Uh, with with me with us and kind of listen a bit about your experiences I know we caught up a little bit there but um, sounds like all well all all safe and good your end yeah yeah uh, you know I was just saying kind of off air you know the, the weather here in Czech Republic can be can be pretty grim in the winter but now now things are changing things have improved so spring is well and truly underway and, and summer is coming and Prague in summer is a, a wonderful city to be be in so Especially, you know, when the weather's nice and you're outside on the grass, you know, coaching. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's a great lifestyle. So, yeah, things are great here right now. Perfect. And obviously people would have picked up on there, alluded to kind of where you are. But um, for people that don't know you um, and don't know your role, do you just want to go over kind of what, where you are at the moment and what that entails from, a, I guess, practical context and what you're delivering, et cetera? Yeah, so I'm under 12 head coach at Slavia Prague, um, in Czech Republic. And yeah, my, my role is twofold in the academy. The first one is, is obviously as, as head coach of under 12. So I have my own team, uh, 2010 born, um, and, and I'm head coach of that team. And then I'm also the only kind of native English speaker in the club. So my role is also as kind of like an English specialist, I guess would be the best way to describe it. So I work with my colleagues um, to improve their English ability. Uh, so I deliver conversation classes uh, to people in the stadium. So, for example, uh, technical directors, sporting directors, um, you know, scouts, data analysts, you know, uh, right up to the catering management, you know, kind of every, everyone that wants to improve their English. I'm kind of like their go-to guy to, to do that. So a uh, little bit of English teaching, a little bit of coaching. Perfect. So I guess the, the easiest question to start with is how have you ended up there? So we'll kind of whistle stop if you like, but what did your journey entail to get you to the point where you are now in terms of coaching maybe abroad and leaving these shores and deciding that would be a nice fit for you um, and in your coaching career? Yeah, originally uh, I qualified as a history teacher from Cardiff University. Uh, that was around 2010, I think. Um, and I remember at that time, um, I, ca- I kind of decided to be, be a teacher. Both my parents are teachers. And, and for me, I've always wanted to travel around the world. I've always been kind of, you know, quite, quite brave in terms of, you know, the experiences that I wanted to have and, and the risks that I would take in my life. So that's very much part of my personality. So, so I wanted to travel and my parents were obviously, a little bit concerned about that they wanted me to be kind of safe and to have that safety net so they persuaded me to to get my teaching license first um and my background was was always in history my dad's a history teacher and I, f- I find it I still find it today a fascinating subject um so that was that was really my start and then after I graduated I think a lot of graduates they go through this this kind of dilemma of not having enough experience but then no one's willing to give you that experience and as a teacher you know any kind of professional job it's very difficult to break that cycle so I got rejected quite a lot from from teaching interviews and I got pretty dejected at one point you know I was down to like my last 300 400 pounds moving around Cardiff, trying to find places that meant that I wouldn't have to go home uh, to Stoke, which is where I'm from originally. Um, and yeah, and then I, I decided that I would put my CV on a teaching website. 
uh, teaching abroad. Um, and then within a few hours, really, it was, it was kind of surreal. There was a school, a Korean school in China, and they contacted me by by phone and, and they asked me, would I be interested in, in going to teach English in China in a new school? Um, obviously, I couldn't speak any Chinese, didn't really know anything about China. It wasn't really on my list of, of places that I wanted to visit or go to. Uh, but they offered me a job. They said they would pay for my flight, um, you know, accommodation. Everything was sorted for me. And obviously, being a broke graduate, <laughs> I kind of had very little choice. But also, I was very excited by the opportunity. Very fortunate. Um, I remember calling my parents, and my mom kind of freaked out a little bit. <laughs> she was crying. She said, "What? You know, what? Why do you want to go there?" And she was excited for me, but she was obviously worried, as as most moms are. My dad is a little bit kind of less uh, emotional, let's say. He said, why are you on the phone to us? You should just accept it. Go, you know, go and do it, you know. So so I, I decided to take that job opportunity. Uh, it was a, a school in Weihai, uh, China, which is like east, east, northeast China. Um, so, yeah, I flew out there. I went down to London, sorted the visa stuff, flew out to China the next week. Um, and then that's where it all really started. So I was teaching English there for a few schools over, I think it was three years I spent there in the end. Ended up meeting a Taiwanese girl while I was on holiday. Um, and then we kind of, you know, became quite serious. So I decided to move to Taiwan. Um, and then it was really in Taiwan that things started to take off for me as a coach. Um, my original break into coaching was actually in a pub. <laughs> I, I was having a beer with, with the owner of this British bar, uh, in, in Taipei, in Taiwan. And, uh, he asked me, you know, at the end of the night, after a few beers, you know, you ask kind of these deep, deeper questions. And he said, what do you really want to do with your life? And I said, well, I'd love to be a football coach. Obviously I loved, always loved football as a kid. Uh, even even I'm a Stoke City fan and, and we didn't have a lot of success <laughs> back then, um, you know, as a child, you know, I always wanted to be a football player first, didn't have the ability. So the next next logical step is as a coach. And he said, well, my best friend is is the owner of a, a football academy on the island, uh, probably the biggest academy. So I can put you in touch. And then within a week, I uh, had a trial, loved it was quite natural obviously coming from a teaching background into coaching like you know it's kind of ed educational delivering information communication this kind of kind of uh, these transferable skills and uh yeah it just kind of grew from there really I, my first season was part-time then i moved to full-time while i was part-time I, I was teaching uh this obviously helped to like supplement my income which is something I recommend to all coaches, especially those who haven't played professional uh, football before. This is a really good way to travel and and to kind of, you know, get your foundation while you're looking for coaching work and while you're gaining that coaching experience. So that's what I did. And then I went full time after a year, coached four years in total in Taiwan. And then I think it was around my 30th birthday, I, I kind of realized, well, you know, there's no professional football in, in Taiwan. So, you know, if you want to make, you know, I, you know, don't get me wrong. It was a great academy, really good career, you know, really good lifestyle. You know, I had lots of friends. I had a, obviously my girlfriend at the time, everything was like really kind of, I built myself a really nice life. And then, you know, you kind of have these moments where you're thinking in your life, well, you know, this is all well and good, but what do I want to do in the end? You know, what's the end goal? And I wanted to be a professional football coach. And if there's no professional football in Taiwan, then you, you have to move, right? So so I decided for the sake of my career that, that I would take a, a bit of a risk. I did some research. Prague was, was one of the destinations that looked, you know, kind of attractive, uh, not just for football, but for you know, for life, lifestyle. And I had some friends that have lived in Prague. They recommended it. So I, I sent emails to lots of different uh, academies around Europe. And this guy in Prague, he owns, uh, I think it's Prague English Football School, if I'm going to name drop. <laughs> um, and yeah, he, he invited me. He invited me to Prague to work for his academy. It's like an amateur academy, you know, just for small kids. 
And I thought, well, it's a good introduction, you know, to, to get my foot, you know, in the door uh, in Czech Republic, find myself a little foundation. And then, you know, I did some research on, on the owner and, and it turns out that he has some background with Slavia. Um, you know, he, he coached in, I think under 19s at some point as an assistant coach or, you know, I, I did my, my research on him and I thought to myself, the back of my mind, I thought, well, you know, give yourself maybe three, four years in Prague and maybe you can build up to, to be in Slavia. So that was always like in the back of my mind. And then I remember I arrived, I did some teaching again. I was working in restaurants, uh, was working in a charity shop at one point. And then in the time that I was able, I sent an email to Slavia. Um, I sent a couple of emails. Uh, through this this guy, the owner of this Prague English football school, um, he then kind of got me in touch with them. They replied to me after a couple of emails, and then they invited me for for a trial or for an interview. I went in, um, and after I don't know around thirty minutes, they said, "Well, how about we kind of cooperate?" And what that meant was that I would work for free, like volunteer within the academy um you know and, and give kind of english language experience to players and coaches um and in return i would then be able to coach in that environment and kind of learn in a professional kind of environment so for me that was a no brainer big opportunity um as i said in the meantime i was working different jobs to to make ends meet while i was doing this kind of internship if you like um, and then after six months, you know, they offered me a part-time, part-time contract. So the next couple of years, I was then, uh, teaching English in the morning. And then I would go in the afternoon to Slavia to coach. And then that then became two years ago, that became full-time. Uh, so I was only coaching, uh, as an assistant coach and then also teaching English in the inside the academy. And then this season started this season I was asked if I wanted to be head coach of the under 12s and obviously you know in, when they first asked me I, I kind of panicked I didn't expect it it was very unexpected one of the coaches one of I think he was foundation phase lead he decided that he wanted to leave the club uh, at the end of the season and so the person who was supposed to be the coach of the under 12s he then went up to foundation lead and then there was a position open. Obviously, I was assistant coach of that category last season. So they said, well, do you want to be head coach this season? So, so I, of course, I, I jumped to that opportunity and, and that's kind of where I am today, really. This is my first season, you know, of, of being head coach in a professional academy. And, and it's been absolutely incredible. Every day is absolutely incredible, to be honest. It's, it's one of, I, yeah, it's unbelievable. I can't, I can't believe that I'm in this situation. So very, very grateful and, and very fortunate, uh, to be in this position now. Uh, I think it's a really interesting journey. And I think it shows that, um, you know, almost not fate, but the way that if you just kind of embrace stuff, a drunken conversation at the end of the night means, oh, actually, I want to be a football coach kind of takes you down a completely different path. I guess the question for me straight away is, once you realised that that was an avenue you wanted to explore, what became your driver? Was it the wanting to travel or was it the, I want to be a football coach and then I'll travel in order to do that? Kind of what was the driver behind making decisions once you realised actually this is something that I want to do more than necessarily teaching? I think like in, first of all, like I was very fortunate in Taiwan because the company that I worked for, they they allowed me to travel quite regularly. Um, they gave me, you know, vacation. I, I every three months I got like a few days where I could go and, and travel and they paid for some of the flight. So it gave me like a big opportunity to travel while I was working. And then obviously in terms of the move to the Czech Republic, then that that was you know, the, the situation in my life and my kind of ambition to be a professional football coach, that was the main driver behind the travel. So sometimes it's the travel that's the driver and sometimes it's the job, but always they go hand, hand in hand. I think, um, it's about, it's about your lifestyle and, and what you're willing to sacrifice. You know, 
there's a lot of people will will look at my situation and, and situation of coaches who have similar kind of stories to me and and they will say wow amazing you know they they're quite kind of not jealous but they're you know they they would they would like to be in the same situation but then also you make those sacrifices you know the more you travel the less you put down those roots and then you miss out on for example like seeing my family you know seeing my friends back at back at home you know kind of settling down and and having a family you know having a house having a car you know these these kinds of things you you sacrifice so it's partly travel and and partly partly a job and and your your ambition i guess a little bit of both and then strategies to cope with that because obviously we talk about it with with coaches and probably players and you know i don't think it's an uncommon thing for coaches to move away from family to normally okay in the uk it might be away for a different club and they'll come back at weekends or what that looks like but i think the world's getting smaller and smaller i think we're all aware of that and there's situations with people going out to Asia or America or wherever and family being here. Have you found any particular strategies useful to deal with that in terms of being away from home for substantial periods and maybe not seeing friends and family as much? uh, much? Is there any ways that you figured out ways to combat that and make it a little bit easier for yourself and for your family and friends? Um, I think like my personality is I'm quite independent anyway. So and my, my family, we're not the kind of people who need to speak every single day. Um, you know, my my family, they like my parents that like my dad is from Wales and my mum is from Shropshire and they they went to university in North Staffordshire in Stoke. And then they met in at university and then me and my brother were born in Stoke. So that we've always kind of been away from from my grandma of course you know Shropshire and and Stoke you're talking an hour hour and a half down the road so it wasn't far away but then it wasn't like next door you know so we were always kind of away from from family anyway so my I remember being when I was a kid we we didn't really settle in one place we moved around a lot you know with my parents jobs and you know we we lived in three or four different places. So I was quite used to kind of moving around and, and not having those roots. So it's made me quite independent as a person anyway. I think obviously you've got like social media and you, and you have these kind of ways of communicating like Zoom, like, you know, like WhatsApp and, and these kinds of, you know, possibilities anyway. The one thing that I did do when I first arrived in China is obviously they have the the great firewall of china you know you, you can't use a lot of the social media apps that you would in the uk and back in 2010 i didn't even have a smartphone when i moved there so you know that was quite a challenge originally um especially with the culture shock of of living in china you know it's it's very different and i remember the first three months six months was very difficult i wanted to leave and then I had a phone call with my dad and and we talked about, you know, what I would do if I went home and kind of what the prospects were at home. And he said, you'd be stupid to leave because you, you have this kind of opportunity there, you know, so you should make the most of that. You don't know how long that's going to last for. And kind of, I took that on board and I remember I had the opportunity to, my boss was very kind of understanding and he gave me the opportunity to either go home for a month and and then come back to China or he gave me like a couple of weeks holiday to go and see other places in China just to get away from from you know the the place that I was in and yeah with the help of my dad I he kind of persuaded me to to do the second you know to take the second option so I remember I went to Beijing for Chinese New Year and that opened my eyes like completely to how amazing this this opportunity was and and this place was so i think sometimes travel helps with that it takes my mind off things you know when i travel to new places it kind of helps me to not forget my family that sounds really harsh but it helps me to not be as homesick i'm focused more on new experiences and less on like the familiar if that makes sense obviously i still talk to my family you know occasionally we call you know t- together and especially at christmas i went home at christmas actually this time um after the pandemic and you know we we find ways to keep in touch and you know the 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 the, the bottom line the end of it is that you like your family is always there 
like they're always there and their lives continue, but you also have your life to lead. And, you know, if it makes you happy, then you, that's what you should be doing, you know, and traveling and coaching makes me happy. If I was at home, you know, and if I had a house in Stoke <laughs> and I wasn't coaching, it wouldn't make me happy. And then my parents wouldn't be happy. So I think as long as everyone has that kind of realization and, and care for each other's happiness, then, then I think that it's, that it's absolutely fine. But I, I appreciate every, every person is different and every family is different, you know, and how they communicate and, and their personalities. So it's, uh, I'm fortunate that with my family and with my personality, that it's quite well suited to be in, in this environment, you know, where you're kind of away from, from the familiar. Um, I mean, the, the other, the other way to do that is, or the other way of looking at it is that you build your own family. So Slavia it sounds quite cheesy, but Slavia is kind of like my family, really. You know, I live, I live on the site. I work here. You know, I see the same people every day, you know, that, that I care about and, and that care about me. And, and we kind of support each other. You know, they're my support group. Um, and, you know, I have with the Raptors, you know, the Raptors project, we have 50, 50 nationalities now. And so like I meet people from all around the world and we are like a family, you know, we take care of each other. So I find, find comfort in, in that as well. You can build your own family. This is what my, my parents taught me, you know, from their, their experience and from my upbringing. So family is in different places, you know. Well, that makes complete sense. And I think something that would be interesting to discuss now is I guess you've had some from an educational point of view. But then obviously some in more of a football context. But how does um, culture affect the way that you're able to communicate with players or individuals when you're trying to teach or coach them? Because I imagine it would have been a big jump from the work that you were doing in the UK to then to China to then uh, Taiwan, Czech Republic, etc. What were the key differences between those stop-offs, if you saw any, from culture to culture and is there anything that challenged your preconceptions or, or things that you'd learned when you were doing your um, like degree and whatnot before I think the f the first thing is that you the first factor is that it gives you a different perspective on home like on your upbringing and like British culture British culture and kind of uh, the British way if you like not just in terms of coaching and teaching, but in terms of general culture. And I, I think, and, and also the view of other people of, of your country. You know, this is something that's quite interesting, especially have being in the any, Have you got any specific examples of that? Like, for example, like when I, when I first went to China as a British person, you know, you open your mouth and you, you have like a, a British accent. My accent's a little bit different now, but at the start, you know, I had a big stoky accent. <laughs> and so you, you walk in and, and automatically you're, you're kind of respected because you're teaching English. It's your native language. You're teaching people who perhaps aren't as strong in, in terms of their English language capabilities or even language capabilities or even learning capabilities in, in many ways. And so you're given that respect automatically. Some people abuse that, in my opinion. I've, I've met teachers from Canada, from the UK, from, from America who have abused that position where they almost use that status in order to, to take things easy and to kind of cut corners for themselves. And then I've also met some fantastic teachers who have taken that, that gift of language and that gift of that learning gift that we have in, in the fact that we're very open minded and that we're very, we're taught to be independent thinkers from an early age. You find in, in China, people, because of the, the current government, because of the, the kind of culture, uh, and the political situation in China, people aren't given that ability to think critically and they're not given that ability to think outside of the box. You know, your teacher will tell you this is how it is and that's how it is. There's no questioning that. There's no kind of the teacher doesn't say to you, okay, why did that happen? Or what do you think about that? It's very fact or fact in inverted commas oriented. 
whereas our in, in my opinion our education system is more more creative like the creativity is encouraged you know when i learned history for example i didn't have perfect history teachers at school but i was lucky enough to have my dad at home as a history teacher and i remember the conversations that we had were very different in the he, my dad would ask for my opinion and we would talk very much about history as more of a debate rather than this happened on this uh, this year or this happened at this time blah 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 you know so coming from that educational background into into china which is more of a rigid background or, or rigid approach definitely helped me in terms of how people saw me compared to perhaps chinese people or even taiwanese people so i think that educational background was really helpful for me um and kind of british culture at that time especially was was much healthier when you put that in the context of of the chinese system and and the taiwanese system uh so i i would say i would say that that was like a a key cultural difference um and even even in czech republic you know czech republic is 30 years after communism so their kind of approach to education and and their approach to life is very conservative you know they they don't like taking risks because taking risks in communist time was you know if you got get things wrong or or you made a mistake it could very well lead to a very unpleasant life or you know unpleasant consequences so people are very conservative people don't take so many risks here there's not as much ambition for example and in the uk i think it's something that we're taught from a very young age that ambition and and taking risks and making mistakes are okay and i i think that 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 kind of also provides some differences in the coaching process a lot of the coaches in czech republic they they look at mistakes as being very negative that they're not an opportunity to learn and and to grow and that they're not inevitable whereas i think that a lot of british coaches especially we're taught now to embrace mistakes and encourage mistakes because that's how the learning process develops you know that's how the the learning process is so for example the the coaches here they're very command style you know this is how i want you to do it this is how you should do it and if you don't do it in this way then i'm going to not be angry but i'm going to get frustrated whereas in england our style is more like what do you think about this situation how would you solve it okay i think this the coach thinks this the player thinks this that's fine we have a difference of opinion but the player is aware of the different ways to to solve that problem the coach doesn't tell him this is the only way that you can solve it so i think in that in that way there is another a cultural difference in in the czech republic um so i think there are many many different different cultural differences but but in terms of those examples there are ways in which that's impacted my my career and my work experience i would say and then i guess in a practical setting particularly with football because you said there is a level of creativity that's needed you know the top players they'll find creative solutions to get out of circumstances or creative solutions to problems mm. Do you see that as an area of development within both China and the Czech Republic in terms of embracing that freedom of thought which then allows them to solve problems because imagine if you do have a very prescriptive mm-hmm. um way of working and that's what the children use China for example that's what the children in China are used to in terms of we're going to learn these facts and you're going to make sure that you know these facts etc when yeah something falls outside that there's probably going to be a bit of a a breakdown in terms of how they're able to resolve it so is that something that you've seen in practice in terms of maybe the problem solving element and the independent decision making element when it falls outside of a tactical or technical norm that they maybe struggle with more yeah absolutely absolutely i think you've you've hit the nail on the head really in terms of if we're talking about check Czech Republic you know in in China I wasn't a, a coach so I can't really comment on Chinese football but I can definitely comment on Czech football and I think that you're absolutely absolutely right what was interesting is that when I first came to Slavia 
around four or five years ago. The the coaches they, you know, we we used to go to tournaments and the there's obviously after every game there is like an evaluation period. You know, you you speak to your colleagues. Okay, how was the game? What were the good things, bad things, etc. And every single time we would come back from these tournaments and the feedback would be my players make terrible decisions their decision making is is terrible they're not creative and it was almost like it was like you try does that the quote from einstein what is it it's like insanity is trying the same thing twice and expecting different results or or something like that and it it, it felt like that to me that they identified the problem but they just kept doing the same thing like in terms of the coaching and I what I think or like my approach is very different in that I encourage creativity in my players like actively encourage them so for example if they make a mistake I'm not on them all the time uh, I involve them a lot in the in their decision making process how do you want to press today what formation do you want to play uh, how about you know this is the topic today what do you think we should be focused on? How about in this situation? How about his decision? You know, I give the questions to the players, the problems to the players. And then you, it's the key is giving them ownership of the training session. And a, a big, when things go wrong in, in my trainings or in my games, my go to question to the players is, guys, is it my training session or is it your training session? And when the players realize that it's their training session, then they, they are responsible for the decisions that they make. They are responsible for, for the results of those decisions, the consequences of those, those decisions. They are responsible for their behavior. And in this way, you create independent thinkers and you create an active learning environment. If the coach, if the players think that it's the coach's training session, it belongs to the coach, then in in that way, it's only a one way process, and the players then switch off, and they they're not actively engaged with with the concepts and the principles that you're trying to get across to them. And this is also something that I I realized is that there was a lot of frustration in the coaches here when I arrived. Well, you know, they they would say to me things like, "Well, I've told him a million times, and he keeps doing the same thing. He's making the same mistakes." And don't get me wrong; I'm not saying that that's what they did, and that's what you know. I I was perfect. I did the same same as well. You know, this is my first professional coaching experience, also. And so, like, it would get to a point where I would say to them, "Well, why why do you think that that's the case?" You know, like, and the the end result of that was that. For example, coaches here don't use tactics boards to get across the information. When they uh, coach, they don't stop the game. The intervention is very limited here. It's all about ball movement, ball time, which for me, okay, there is a debate that the more the ball moves and the more the player touches the ball, the, you know, the, the better he will be, but it has to be within some context. You have, it's, for me, it's about the quality of the time, not the quantity. We have two hour training sessions in Slavia, which means we're very fortunate. A lot of clubs only have an hour or an hour and a half. We have two hour sessions, which means that you can squeeze out a lot of quality. Even if out of that two hours, you only get an hour and a half of ball time, that's still an hour and a half of absolute quality where the players have got a lot of information. And so, like we talked about, like the style of the coaching, like interventions, using different ways to get across the message. So like video, we got, now we've got two VO cameras. We've got uh, Panoris, I think it's uh, installed in one of the grass pitches that we have at the academy. So, you know, we're recording training sessions, uh, matches, and we're analyzing, doing a lot more video analysis than we ever used to. We're using tactics boards. For me, it's really important because my language is English and the players are Czech, so it's in their second language. I'm showing them, you know, physical demonstrations. The ball is moving; they are moving. You know, these these types of like learning styles. You you've got to hit all of them in order to get the success that you want from the players. In my in my opinion, I know that some coaches won't agree with that. I know that learning styles have kind of been debunked a little bit in education. But I still think that they play a part in the learning process. And How has this, this is... been received? So if you've got a situation where in a naturally conservative country because of their historical 
challenges. And then you're coming in with this way that probably goes against the grain slightly. It probably isn't, the players aren't used to it. Parents probably aren't that used to it. Neither of the other coaches. How mm. was that received? And how did you go around challenging individuals to say, well, this might be a way for us to improve that decision making or improve on areas of the game that we're currently not so great in? I think that that was a, it still is a great difficulty. Like, we we worked really hard in the lockdown. So me and two of my colleagues, more actually, maybe four or five of my colleagues, we're really fortunate at this time, or we were at that time, and even more so now, is that we were able to get together five or six really kind of young, motivated coaches who were very progressive, pro progressive uh, thinkers. And we we decided that we wanted a change in the methodology of the academy. So we we were invited. It's a uh, a coach called Ross Brooks. He's a West Ham United coach, um, and he he created this worldwide coaching group that we have on WhatsApp. So there are coaches from I think he set one up in the foundation phase, uh, youth development phase, and I think maybe now there's a professional development phase group as well. And this was really key for us because we approached this group with coaches from all around the world at professional academies. And we said, guys, what do you, what does your methodology look like? How do you, you know, your process, what are your processes? How do you kind of coach the kids? You know, how do you work with this? And so we had meetings with the primary one was uh, Seattle Sounders. Um, we taught with, forget his name Matt Porter I think Matt Baker I forget forget exactly I'm, I'm terrible I should remember the, these things he helped me so much but like we we worked with Seattle Sounders we had a, a conference like a zoom conference with them with uh with Matt and then also with five or six of my colleagues these these coaches that wanted to improve things we sat down with him for around an hour and a half two hours and I can honestly say that it's probably the most important two hours of my life so far because every single one of us after this presentation where Matt presented Matt Brewer his name is not Porter or Baker Brewer <laughs> I knew it was a job <laughs> yeah and anyway so he he kind of uh, presented the methodology of, of Seattle Sounders and he showed us like how they operate and after the two hour call we then had like a private call with the Slavia coaches and it was just silent for about 10 minutes everyone was like they couldn't believe what they've just seen and so obviously I, I knew that a lot of this existed before but not in that much detail but for these guys that was the first time they'd ever seen something like that so it's almost like in answer to your question you know how do you persuade them or, or, or how do you work work with that how do you get that message across i think in many ways it's about proving something if you can prove that other academies have success with this and that this is how they operate then you're showing your colleagues that this is how they should be doing it you know it's not just coming from me as one coach it's coming from big academies around the world and so after that two hours we sat down uh to speak about it like i said our minds were blown <laughs> we were absolutely destroyed mentally after that but we then set about using the time that we had in lockdown to develop a new slavia methodology in the academy and we ri ripped it up from top to bottom like completely ripped it up and we started again and we created a periodization. We created uh, this methodology with topics, with coaching points. You know, coaches who are listening to this now will will be amazed that that we we didn't have that before because this is something that's a foundation of every successful academy. And so we decided that we were going to rip everything out. We we started with this new new process, this new methodology, new philosophy, everything. Um, and this was, like I said, in lockdown. And this is the first season where we've actively started to use this methodology. And so now we work with topics. You know, the periodization means that the topics are built together. We've got a, like an identity now, a style of play who go, that goes from under six all the way up to under 19, B team. And we're in the process now of refining that methodology. But we also have to take the video 
video uh, recordings of the training sessions as part of the process because we are almost trying to convince everybody in the academy that this is the way forward. And the only way that you do that is by showing them active results. Look at this video of this game. Look how this connects with the methodology. Look how the training session connects with the game. And it's almost like you're proving, you have to prove yourself and the methodology. And my feeling now is that it's proved. I think everyone's on board with it, but we're now refining the processes to make sure that it's suitable, A, for Slavia, and B, for the players that we're, we're getting from the schools and that it fits properly with the Czech education system so that we're able then to make the process more and more efficient. And did you feel pressure on that? Because I'd imagine if you, know, you, you, you went and had all these talks and discussions and meetings and stuff, and then in the first six weeks, eight weeks, you're getting battered every week at every age group because you're trying to play out from the back where previously we're going more direct or your players are trying skills in their own box and losing it and conceding goals, you're probably yeah. going to get some coaches that are going to go, what are we doing? This is a complete sham. Did you feel pressure to see some success early on to kind of show that actually this this is aligned with what the top clubs are doing and look, we're doing it and we're getting success from it and it might produce us a better style and standard of player moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I think to start with, I mean, even, even now, like, I'll be honest, you know, we, we went to Poznan, we went to play Lech Poznan a few weeks ago, my category under 12, and we got pumped 9-0 <laughs> in the game. And, uh, the under 13s, I think they traveled with us, uh, they lost, I can't remember, by six or seven goals. So, yeah, of course, the results won't always go your way because it's a brand new process. You've got to remember that in under 11, under 12, under 13, these boys have already had three, four years of a different type of methodology. So you're not going to solve that in one year or less than a year. So I'm lucky that I work with good football people, smart people, progressive people. So they are aware that it's not about results. It's about the kind of process you know developing the process because quite realistically we would you know every coach i think wants all of their players to go on and, and be better players and you know in this case in slavia to be professional football players but the reality is it's not realistic it's not going to happen so you know we're quite prepared to sacrifice is the wrong word but we're quite prepared to not have that success with this category but we're almost using these guys as guinea pigs so we know that when for example the the kids who are coming in now are under six under seven the young youngest categories by the time they get to under 12 they're going to be at that level that we that we wanted from them they're going to be six years into the methodology and not one so we're almost playing catch up with the guys that we've got now, but it's using this time to practice and refine what we're hopefully going to have for the under sixes when they get to this level in six years, six years time. So and you well, mentioned, you mentioned in terms of it fitting in with the educational system. So I kind of got two questions that one, what does your working week actually look like? So how does it fit around what? They well, what schooling they're doing, when do you train, when do you play games, what does kind of a working week look like? And then secondly, and this one might be harder to answer, is how does it impact the players fluctuating from one maybe methodology to another? Because if you have them at school where it's very structured, as in, you, I don't know, similar, you might be seen and not heard, the facts are the facts, you listen, be quiet. And then you guys are coming in with this open-ended questions. How do you feel? What are your thoughts? They mm. could go from a morning of one to an afternoon of the other. And it's like flicking back and forth from, from time to time, which could be challenging. So I guess, yeah, the first one is what does it look like for your academy? How does it actually fit? And the second one, how have you seen the players cope with that flip-flop between the two? Like the, the first thing is, so we work... Um, we work on a basis. So with, with my team, with the under 12, so we train four times a week. Uh, we train from two till four o'clock in the afternoon. 
Um, and then matches are on Saturday and Sunday, usually, depending on the tournament. Sometimes we have league matches within the Czech Republic. Sometimes we travel to other countries for tournaments. Uh, it depends really what we want. Like it's up to the head coach to decide. Obviously, we get invited to a lot of tournaments. Being Slavia, you know, the name means that we're invited to a lot of big tournaments, which is quite nice. So we get those experiences. But in terms of the games, usually Saturday and Sunday in different formats. Um, and then also we, so the kids in the morning, they go to school in the morning. We have a school that's located next to the training facility. Um, and a lot of my players go to that school. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, the ones who go to the school, they also have, sometimes they have morning sessions, uh, which are like PE classes. So, for example, on a Wednesday, my boys in the morning, they will have like an athletics uh, class and that will be taken by our athletics coach who works within Slavia. Um, and I will also be there to to kind of help and to watch and, and just to interact with, with the players. Um, we have on a Tuesday, we have a technical skills coach uh, who works with different categories throughout the academy. And he comes on a Tuesday morning and he delivers the technical skills session to these kids who are in the school next to the academy. Um, and then on a Thursday, the first half an hour of the morning session is with a conditioning coach. So he comes in and he does like different different movements with them. So, for example, he works on their reaction coordination. Uh, he's been working on like their squat form, I guess you could say different different types of movement strength power these kinds of kinds of things so we also do a lot of you know uh, different types not just football related but also sports in general um we have on friday morning the players do gymnastics as well within the school we have a gymnastics coach he comes in for an hour and, and does gymnastics with them so the mornings are usually uh, not every day mondays are free for them but usually in the mornings, they do kind of extra sporting activities. And then in the afternoon, they come to us for the, the team team session. We have Tuesday and Thursday, uh, we have a goalkeeper coach who comes in, works with our goalkeepers for the first, usually first 30 minutes to an hour of the session, depending on what the head coach allows or wants, depending on our plan. We, we send our goalkeepers away with the goalkeeper coach. Um, and then... Yeah, that's that's pretty much pretty much the the structure. So we're like I said to you before, you know, we're we're very fortunate that we have a lot more contact time with the players than other clubs. Um and really it's about getting the most out of that contact time uh with, with the players. So every session is two hours and then they also have the, the extra session, like I said, in, in the morning. So in, in terms of the structure, that's that's how we operate. Um, and then your second second question is, is quite interesting for me. The the bottom line of it, the simple answer is that the, the boys absolutely love it. They absolutely love it because it's almost like freedom for them. You know, in the school, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and bash the teachers. I know how difficult teaching is myself, you know. So I know that, that you know, teachers have their own styles and, and you know, I'm not say, sitting here and saying it's got to be in this style or, you know in this way because i'm not czech and and you know i'm i'm not fully acclimatized to the culture so i'm not going to sit here and, and lecture teachers on how to teach but what i will say is that our approach in the academy now is is obviously much different and we've we've had regular feedback from the players we sit down with them especially when we go to like winter camps or summer camps or you know any training camp we'll sit down with them and, and we will ask them one-to-one -one and and together collectively what do you think about the training process what do you think about you know the training sessions the methodology you know and one of the things that's quite interesting is that the that my players they're very smart they're very very smart you know they they talk about what it was like before with previous coaches what it's like now they can compare the training sessions of both coaches they can kind of talk about the positives and negatives and it's been an overwhelmingly positive response from the players. And I think in any youth football in 
professional or amateur level, the enjoyment of the players is always paramount, you know, with, with kids. And one of the things that I'm really, really happy about is that the players absolutely love it. And the, the one the one thing for my players that they get is that obviously all of our sessions are in English. So the players are very, you know, they, they love speaking English because it's different, because they know that it's healthy for them in terms of their prospects later in life, because it's a challenge for them. And these players, you know, there's a reason why they're in a professional football academy, because they have the character that they want to improve themselves, that they want to, they, you know, they have ambition. And so it's really a special environment in my team that the players, that, you know, they love the methodology. They love the fact that, that we as coaches value them, you know, that we value their opinion, that we value their ability. I tell them all the time that they're, they're great. You know, we're positive with them. I say, guys, when I was a kid, I didn't have an inch of the talent that you've got now. You know, I'm in awe of their talent sometimes. I tell them that. I think it's important that they hear that. You know, from a lot of coaches, they they work not negatively, but they focus a lot on the negatives because they think that the players already know how good they are and they're almost bringing them down all the time. But you've got to remember that these are young kids. They don't know how good they are. They don't have the context you know, they probably go home and maybe some of their parents are telling them, oh, that wasn't good today, or I saw that in the game, that wasn't good. Maybe even as coaches, we say to them, mate, that wasn't good, or, you know, you need to improve that, or, you know, so I think it's really underrated, and it's so easy as a coach that you turn around to them and say, mate, that was amazing, or wow, what a goal, or, you know, I can't believe you did that, or you're so talented. You know, the the players they have to they have to understand that you have to give them confidence in that way, and I think that the methodology gives them that confidence because we're giving them a lot of information and a lot of principles, and it's almost like the players feel that trust from you that wow, coach, because for them the coach knows a lot. You know, he he's kind of above; he's an authority, and the coach trusts me enough to give me that information and that knowledge like it's a special special relationship that you have with the players you know the more information you give them the more they trust you the more they think that you trust them and you build that bond between them you know you have that connection so in, in terms of my category how I work I, I feel that that connection big connection with the players and I'm really proud not about the results yet because it's early days, but I'm really proud of the impact that this this methodology has had on on the players and their self esteem, their self confidence. They come to training with a massive smile on their face. You know, they're happy. You know, we we try to to create this positive environment, and I, I think that it's succeeding massively. Okay, I'm going to ask one last question because I'm conscious for at the time that we said, and it's uh, different to what I normally ask, but I think it's it's important to to hear about it. I know from speaking and being present that the atmosphere that's created at some of the youth football over in the Czech is unbelievable. I know there's there's uh, been stories on April four with Lech Poznan fans with flares at under tens or twelves <laughs> tournaments. For you. Um, what is the best environment like that that you've seen and how did that affect, I guess, you as a coach, but also the kids themselves? How did that make them feel? And what, what's the best example of that you've seen? I think like if I, if I can, I'll give you two examples. The first one is from the A team, my personal experience. One of the things that I love here is that, okay, like in, in terms of the A team, we've had a lot of success recently. Slavia domestically last season or two seasons ago, we didn't lose a game in the domestic season. So it, we don't lose very often. But one thing I would say is whether we win, lose or draw, the connection between the fans and the players is second to none. They have this thing in Czech called the Jekovačka, and it's like some celebratory song that the players have between the players and the the fans sorry and after every single game they go and and they sing together you know and i i think that this is really special we've lost three nil before four nil and still the players go over to the fans and they still have that connection with them i think that's really really special the first time i saw that i was absolutely amazed i the hairs on the back of my neck still stand up thinking about that i think if you compare that with British football culture, sometimes it's very, very negative. If you if your team loses four nil, you, you get off the pitch, yeah, yeah. 
And I'm not saying I'm not saying look, I'm not sitting here and saying, you know, all Slavia fans are positive. You know, I've never heard any booing or I've never heard any negative comments. But what I am saying is that when all is said and done, you know, that connection between the players and the fans is is really strong. I mean, the stadium itself only holds twenty thousand. And, you know, we, we rarely fill that unless it's for a big European game or, you know, for Sparta, for example, Sparta, Slavia, like local derby. So I, that for me personally, that was that was something that, that really strikes me. And, and I think that it's it's connected with the culture and with the environment of the club as being a healthy environment in which to work and in which to play football. Um, and then, yeah, I would say <laughs> the players this this season, uh, the derby, the derby match. We we've played Sparta a few times, and it's always special. The derby, whether it's under eleven, under twelve, or adult, you know, A team, it doesn't matter. It's always special. And I think we there was one example where we played them in a tournament, and we scored. We won like three one, I think, and we scored one of my players. He scored this amazing goal from from far away, and. He went over to the the Sparta parents with his arms out, like celebrating in front of them, and I just thought that was amazing for like an eleven year old kid to do that. And the the parents, you know, they weren't like you know, obviously they're not throwing things at him, or they're not angry with him, but just that kind of level of feeling that he felt like he could do that was like really special because that shows the confidence, you know, the self confidence in the players that we were trying to build. So I would say that that that's quite a special memory. Um, we won a tournament, Spojica, it's called, and that's like the best uh, 15 teams in Czech Republic. We won that. It was like a big Champions League style trophy. And watching the players, like their reaction after that was incredible. Like they've, the team that I have, they're, they're not used to a lot of success. They're not like one of the standout categories in the academy or they weren't before. So when they win stuff, it's special for them. You know, they, they haven't had that experience before. So that was earlier this season as well. And then finally, there was a goal that we scored. I put it on my social media, actually. Uh, it was a couple of months ago against Sparta. And I think it was like 11 passes, but it was like two or three switches of play. Uh, and then the player, same player who scored earlier in the season and kind of went to the parents, he... He hit this one from around 20, 25 yards in the top corner after this great team move. And for me, that was really special because it was almost like a realisation of everyone that this methodology works and that the, the players are able to do it. Like, And and for me, that was like a real key moment that it's not going to happen every time, but when it does happen, it's pretty spectacular and you know it kind of makes everyone feel good. My bosses were watching that as well, which I was quite happy about that they saw that happening. Um, because again, you know, it's almost proving to everyone that it works and, and that this is a methodology worth following. And, and finally the, the players were, were really happy with that. And, and, you know, to have that vindication of all the hard work they put in, all the hard work that the coaches put in and to have that kind of released in one moment of quality in under 12 football was like really special. So. I think I'll I'll never forget that goal. I think that will be something that will stay with me for the rest of my career. Perfect. Listen, Jonathan, I appreciate we're over the time we allotted for this, so I'll let you go. But I think we haven't touched on half the stuff we could have done. So hopefully this could be, a, we'll catch up again at another date. But really appreciate your time and um, keep up the good work and we'll catch up with you again soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity. You know, being being on, on these kinds of podcasts, it's, it's always a privilege and, and an honour and, I think what's really interesting is that you speak about these experiences and it gives greater clarity to, to, you know, your life. And you don't, you don't often think about what you've done because you're too busy living in that moment. So it's really nice to reflect and, and to have the opportunity to, to talk to you and, and hopefully reach out to other coaches and other, other people is, is really special. So thank you for that. Thanks. All right. I'll catch you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.